Chapter 3, The Encounter Group, A New Interracial Mode for Integration The ritual of black expression and white submission received a boost from the realm of psychology, which had turned to the issue of race before, but never with as much fervor as in the 1960s and afterward. It was during the heyday of 1960s radicalism that Franz Fanon, who spoke of the revolutionary potential of psychiatry to liberate colonial subjects, became a household name. Fanon's idea that a necessary part of political liberation from colonial oppression was psychological freedom resonated deeply among many American radicals. See Franz Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth. See the critique of this embrace of Fanon by Martin Luther King Jr. in his Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. Henry Louis Gates Jr. writes that in the black radical milieu at the end of the 1960s, violence, or any way talk of violence, had acquired a Fanonist glamour. From Gates, King of Cats, New Yorker, April 8, 1996. Oppression by the mid-1960s seemed to many to involve a state of mind as much as economic and political imbalance. To remedy inequality, it appeared logical that society would have to rid itself of archaic, benighted mental habits, or, in the language of the day, hang-ups. Though the slogan, the personal is political, initially called attention to how personal life was affected by political arrangements, it also captured the sense that transforming American life could begin at the personal level. Much of a generation was inspired by the idea that transforming, even revolutionizing America, could start at the personal level, through interpersonal behavior. However worthy the goal of improving society through individual self-betterment, the definition of self-betterment and particular ideas for bringing it about ultimately sidetracked the struggle for justice and equality. Finding one's identity became more important than the political project of attaining equality or building community, and the subsequent age would suffer the consequences of the attempt to translate revolutionary fervor into concrete changes in the realm of conduct by engineering attitudes under the auspices of democratic change. A major expression of this fusion of therapy and radical personal politics was the human potential movement, which came of age in the 1960s and 1970s, but continued to have an effect in the decades that followed. Social critics have described how this movement symbolized the trajectory of American culture as a whole, a cult of personal growth, part of a broader ascendancy of therapeutic modes of thinking about nearly everything, spawned a new literature, new institutions, and a buoyant sense of unlimited possibility. But the link between the human potential movement and race relations has been all but ignored. Conventional understanding has it that the human potential movement took root in the liberationist milieu of the 1960s and flowered in the 1970s. Tom Wolfe's famous essay, The Me Decade, for instance, explained the new therapies as the result of a heightened religiosity coming out of the counterculture's cult of authentic, intense personal experience. But more obscure histories trace the origins of the sensitivity training movement further back to the years directly following World War II. In fact, sensitivity training, the paradigmatic institution of the human potential explosion, initially arose precisely in the attempt to address interracial as well as interreligious tensions in the post-war era. This suggests a whole new reading of the shift from the early civil rights movement to the so-called black liberation or militant movement, as well as the counterculture. The stage was actually set for the shift to therapeutic politics years before the 1960s, and the experts were well poised to take advantage of it. Their machinations ensured that the therapeutic strain would win out. The Birth of the Tea Group Thanks to the 1960s reportage on the new California fads and interpersonal relations, and exposés on the absurdities of that culture by Tom Wolfe and Christopher Lash, the sensitivity training model, its stress on growth and awareness, its touchy-feely emphasis on letting out feelings before other people, even total strangers, came to be seen as a product of the attenuated counterculture in the late 1960s and 1970s. In fact, the social psychologist Alfred Merrow's 1969 biography of Kurt Lewin illustrates how Lewin's work as a pioneering social psychologist in charge of MIT's Research Center for Group Dynamics in the mid-1940s played a pivotal role in the birth of the T-Group, short for Training Group or Sensitivity Training Group. Faced with the difficulty of translating latent forces of goodwill and communities into overt endeavors to overcome various forms of bias, the Connecticut State Interracial Commission asked Lewin for his assistance in combating racial and religious prejudice. The result was the establishment of the National Training Laboratories, a facility whose purpose was to study the ways in which people might deal more effectively with complex human relationships and problems. Its method came to be known as sensitivity or group dynamics training. Lewin had already launched an organization called the Commission on Community Interrelations for the American Jewish Congress, and the group had amassed much information about group behavior. Lewin agreed to use his organization's limited resources to conduct a change experiment to fulfill the request for a training program by the Connecticut State Interracial Commission. The experiment would involve a workshop that would simultaneously train people for community action against prejudice and conduct research on what changed the attitudes of the trainees in the program. This is significant. From the start, the sensitivity training idea rested on the questionable premise that those already in the program, who might have been deemed to be among the converted, required the same changes in attitude as the hypothetical bigot for whom the program was designed. In any case, Lewin led a large team of trainers, observers, and researchers in designing a two-week workshop in 1946 at Teachers College in New Britain, Connecticut.
As Mero describes it, the workshop aimed to train 41 people, mostly teachers and social workers, and a few labor leaders and businessmen, half of whom were either black or Jewish. These participants professed a range of goals, including developing interpersonal skills, exploring the sources of prejudice, learning how to alter attitudes, and reaching an understanding of their own attitudes and values. The workshop involved mainly open discussion by participants, whom the staff, in the spirit of egalitarianism, treated as equals. In the evenings, most of the participants joined their families, but those who did not asked to join the evening meetings, during which staff members digested their daily observations. There was initial concern about having participants listen in on reports that involved their own behavior, but Lewin liked the idea. One staff member said that the result triggered a tremendous electric change as people reacted to data about their own behavior. Merrill writes, thus, the role of feedback in a T training group was discovered. Both trainees and staff responded enthusiastically to the nightly sessions. The feedback sessions were thus institutionalized, becoming the high point of the training. These sessions added to the amount of time participants already spent in the daytime analyzing their own behavior. In the end, the consensus was that the workshop was a success. Six months later, approximately three-quarters of the trainees reported that they used the methods they learned in the workshop, especially role-playing, and that they could handle group relations more skillfully, citing increased sensitivity to the feelings of others, greater optimism about making progress, and better performance in working with people, in planning action, in bridging the gaps between good intentions and actual behavior. The Connecticut workshop spawned the formation in 1947 of the National Training Laboratories, originally in Bethel, Maine, an organization devoted to the practice of sensitivity training. Looking back 20 years later on the origins of sensitivity training, its pioneers stressed what they viewed as the tremendous importance of the new method for addressing interpersonal relations. Warren Bennis wrote that the National Training Laboratories had become by 1967 an internationally recognized and powerful force affecting almost all of the social institutions in our society. Leland Bradford, a leader of the Connecticut Workshop and director of the National Training Laboratories beginning in 1947, later boasted of the vast growth of sensitivity training as a technique and of the National Training Laboratories as a center of continuing research in the field. Lewin's great concept of creating here-and-now data, analyzing it, and using feedback, Bradford wrote, remains the essential element in all the many variations of sensitivity training and encounter groups that have developed on every continent and in almost every land. Carl Rogers also stressed the importance of the new workshop style, proclaiming in 1968 that sensitivity training is perhaps the most significant social invention of this century. The demand for it is utterly beyond belief. It is one of the most rapidly growing social phenomena in the United States. It has permeated industry, is coming into education, is reaching families, professionals in the helping fields, and many other individuals. These observations might best be dismissed as boosterism on the part of sensitivity training's proponents, who assumed the method's omnipresence was a positive development. Strangely, though, they also capture a basic truth that has not been fully examined. The sensitivity training method did become all-pervasive, in ways its early proponents could hardly have foreseen. A Higher Awareness – The Human Potential Vanguard In the late 1960s, observers cited the vast increase in the use of sensitivity training in the human potential movement. The journalist Jane Howard's book, Please Touch, A Guided Tour of the Human Potential Movement, published in 1970, built on an article she had published in Life in 1968. It gave extensive evidence for her claim that the movement constituted a cultural development of major influence and significance. Reflecting thoughtfully on her numerous experiences with it, Howard captured the spirit of a movement that claimed, with unabashed exuberance, to be in the vanguard of social relations of all kinds, by allowing people to develop a higher level of awareness of their feelings. At the end of her book, a ten-page list of the growth centers and related institutions where human potential work was currently conducted established just how prevalent the new philosophy and techniques had become. Human potential came to refer to a range of eclectic approaches aimed at eliciting what adherents thought was the untapped capacity for some kind of transcendence. What they were transcending was not always clear, but it generally involved numbness or tension resulting from the repression of everyday existence. Rescue would come through a personal awakening to the full range of human emotions and sensations, and even extrasensory capacities. The movement's general premise was that, with new, particularly non-cognitive experiences, an individual could achieve a level of self-awareness not ordinarily imaginable. This self-awareness, enshrined as an end in itself, represented a potential source of social progress. If the general population tapped into this source, social and personal problems could become figments of the benighted past. Typical of the movement's hubris, but capturing to some degree its cultural import, the psychologist Carl Rogers, one of the most prominent advocates of personal growth, claimed that it was the most significant social invention of this century. George Leonard, another major adherent, thought the movement was in the process of ushering in a whole new form of education that promised to do nothing short of bringing on a new age. Education's new domain is not bound in by the conceptual, the factual, the symbolic, he wrote in his 1968 book on the new movement, Education and Ecstasy. It includes every aspect of human existence that is relevant to the new age. To move into it, we don't have to wait for the 21st century. Look Magazine, in turn, called Leonard's work the most influential book on education in modern times.
The Human Potential Movement was an unwieldy collection of practices and approaches. Its diverse field of advocates included everyone from Frederick Perls, the German psychiatrist who founded Gestalt Therapy, to Abraham Maslow, Paul Tillich, Eric Fromm, and many others. Despite their eclecticism, the human potential advocates often shared the belief that growth could best occur in the sensitivity training group. By the time the movement took off, the national training laboratories had already practiced the T-group for two decades. In the experimental, no-holds-barred atmosphere of the 1960s, the T-group's emphasis on the expansion of horizons through intense encounters with other people, hence the rise of the term encounter group, used frequently as a synonym for training group, caught fire. As Jane Howard put it, the movement's most salable commodity is the intensive group experience, known in some quarters as the encounter, and in others as the T-group, T for training, or sensitivity training workshop or training laboratory. The formal task of such groups involved concentrated explorations into interpersonal relations and other factors in individual psychic well-being. Howard captured the essence of the small group encounter as a gathering of roughly a dozen, quote, personable, responsible, certifiably normal, and temporarily smelly people. Their destination is intimacy, trust, and awareness of why they behave as they do in groups. Their vehicle is candor. Exhorted to get in touch with their feelings and to live in the here and now, they sprawl on the floor of a smoky room littered with styrofoam coffee cups, half-empty Kleenex boxes, and overflowing ashtrays. As they grow tired, they rest their heads on rolled-up sweaters or corners of cot mattresses or each other's laps. Some of them shout, seethe, sob, attack, and eventually embrace each other. All of them survive long spells of silence. Eventually touching people from nearly every walk of life, including businessmen, psychologists, ex-weightlifters, professors, dancers, and theologians, another article announced encounter activities were conducted under the auspices of the major social institutions, church, factory, school, and state. T-groups took place in a growing number of locations, from church basements, universities, and corporations to those places more formally designated growth centers. The small group activities of the movement were at times supplemented by conventions of thousands of people. The movement grew tremendously in the late 1960s, with 37 actual growth centers estimated in 1969 to over 100 in 1970. This long list included such communities as Kairos in San Diego, Grow in New York City, Oasis in Chicago, Espiritu in Houston, Quest in Washington, D.C., Adanta in Decatur, Georgia, and Sky Farm Institute in Calais, Vermont. Attempting to capture the essence of the movement's appeal, Howard cited its ability to address a wide range of perceived needs. The human potential movement is many things. It is a business, a means of recreation, a subculture, a counterculture, a form of theater, a philosophy of education, a kind of psychotherapy, and an underground religion, with its own synods, sects, prophets, schisms, and heretics. She added, depending on who is assessing it, it is also a passing fad, a godsend, a silly collection of parlor games, or a menace. As Howard implied, the movement had not only as advertisers like George Leonard and Carl Rogers, but as detractors as well. In one damning instance, the writer George Steiner gave a seminar at a human potential center and expressed his skepticism at what he had found or failed to find. What's the point of self-discovery if there's nothing or very little there to discover? All that's accomplished by having them go even deeper inside themselves is to show them what bores they are. Wolf's The Me Decade displayed what he concluded was the movement's absurd obsession with the self, particularly with minor personal problems. In The Culture of Narcissism, Christopher Lash delivered a more sustained attack on the folly of what he called pseudo-self-awareness, which he thought appealed to the narcissistic personality of the age, the main characteristic of which was an infantile inability to see where the individual self left off and the rest of the world began. To Lash, the human potential movement represented both the belief in the primacy of the self's impulses and the ultimate sense of meaninglessness and despair attendant on the inevitable disappointment resulting from such a belief. While critics have explored the negative consequences of the human potential philosophy for American culture, few have made any link between the movement and how race relations played themselves out in the aftermath of the civil rights movement. This is a peculiar omission. The way race relations came to be thought of and dealt with had everything to do with the rise of the therapeutics offered by the human potential movement. The tea group or encounter group had its heyday in the 1960s and 70s. A humorous exploration of two couples who flirt with group sex and spend time at SLN getting in touch with their deepest feelings, the film Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice beautifully captured the enlistment of the encounter group in the counterculture's crusade to question received strictures on interpersonal conduct and explore all available avenues of personal fulfillment and intense emotional experience. The original T group faded from use after that period, primarily retained only in a less dramatic incarnation in group therapy dedicated to addressing interpersonal problems. Although it is no longer the popular discrete institution that it used to be, it does live on. If anything, its influence has grown. In fact, in many settings it has become the dominant mode of expression, a style of interpersonal interaction that helps set the parameters of social relations.
The encounter mode aims at nearly instant results, the breaking down of interpersonal barriers through uninhibited communication, and the breaking down of individual barriers to self-development and self-fulfillment through total self-disclosure. To grasp its resonance for Americans since the 1960s is to weigh the effects of the convergence of major political crises and demands for reform, especially in the civil rights and anti-war movements, and the longer-term cultural changes that had brought all hierarchy, control, and authority into question. In this setting, the individual became the appropriate unit of social change. The notion of consciousness or awareness seemed intriguing and unlimited. Heightened sensitivity to outside stimulation became an end in itself, and laying bare one's inner being represented an assault on the mind-numbing, sensory-deprived world the older generation has passed down. The convergence of protest against political hierarchy and the decline of traditional cultural authority helped transform the self into a political project, lending self-exploration a sense of higher purpose. The mushrooming of the field of psychotherapy helped set the stage for this new preoccupation with self-awareness. By the 1960s, a number of new therapies vied for Americans' attention and helped cast the individual as a new frontier. Therapists often had distinctive approaches, but nothing kept the clients from experimenting with one after another of the new therapies, causing overlap in the area of reception, even when not in dissemination. Moreover, new institutions like the Encounter Group were less a technique than a unit of treatment. The Encounter Group represented an eclectic intermixture of therapeutic practices, a brief look at the trends in psychotherapy helps show this by laying out some of the strands that came together in the encounter group. The Psychotherapy Explosion One of the most important developments in 20th century American life was the vast explosion of psychotherapy. The number of psychotherapists multiplied rapidly over the century, the number of Americans who sought some form of psychotherapy increased dramatically, and the number of therapeutic approaches abounded. Furthermore, psychotherapy gathered tremendous influence outside of clinical practice as a way of explaining personal and social problems. A drastic shift occurred, as well, when psychotherapeutic techniques became widely accepted as appropriate for an ever-broadening range of everyday issues or life problems, rather than being reserved for seriously debilitating disorders. As psychotherapy became popularized and deemed generally relevant as a lens through which the world should be viewed, therapeutic approaches and assumptions came to blend promiscuously. Therapists of all stripes now practiced hundreds of variants of the major approaches, often combining seemingly opposed techniques, or varying the technique according to the client. Sometimes this conjoining and popularization of psychotherapy resulted in incoherent mixtures of techniques that were inherently at odds. A brief look at the main trends in psychotherapy suggests how incoherent a form of therapy, like the encounter group, that randomly combined techniques could be. As the historian Morton Hunt shows in his far-reaching survey, The Story of Psychology, Psychotherapy by the 1960s bore the imprint of four overarching frameworks for explaining and addressing personal problems, dynamic, behavioral, cognitive, and humanistic psychology. Initiated in the 1920s and 1930s by the popularization of Freud's ideas and the neo-Freudians Eric Erickson, Karen Horney, Eric Fromm, and Henry Stack Sullivan, the movement for dynamic psychology took off after World War II and intensified the demand for psychiatrists and clinical psychologists. While the time-consuming and intensive endeavor of psychoanalysis itself, reaching its high point in the mid-1950s, was never practiced widely, its resonance was great within psychology and the broader culture, and its offspring, dynamic psychology, in the 1980s characterized a third to half of the therapeutic practice, with its conception of psychological problems as resulting from intrapsychic conflicts, unconscious motivations, and the interplay of external demands with components of the personality structure. Behavior therapy also came to the attention of the public in the late 1960s and became widely used in the 1970s and afterward. Howard Liddell, Joseph Wolpe, and Arnold Lazarus pioneered techniques designed to alter behavior with positive associations in the Pavlovian style or desensitization. Other therapeutic techniques of the school included aversive conditioning, association of undesirable behavior with unpleasant sensation, assertiveness training, modeling, influence on behavior through the presence of an individual practicing desirable behavior, or operant conditioning, rewards for desirable behavior. The third approach, cognitive therapy, emphasized that flawed cognitive processes rather than unconscious conflicts caused personal neuroses, and thus demanded a method of getting the patient to rethink his or her faulty expectations and values. Albert Ellis developed rational emotive therapy in the mid-1950s, a method by which the therapist stripped bare the faulty reasoning that lay behind clients' emotional disorders. He believed a warm and accepting demeanor on the part of the therapist merely perpetuated clients' dependency, whereas direct confrontation achieved the desirable unmasking and change of worldview. Through rational emotive therapy, Ellis sought to lead clients to a profound basic philosophic change by altering their dysfunctional basic philosophic assumptions. Another pioneer of cognitive therapy who favored a much less confrontational style was Aaron Beck, a psychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. Drawing partly on behavioral techniques like role-playing and assertiveness training, Beck believed that the therapist needed to guide the client toward an understanding of his or her cognitive errors, 
which caused everything from inertia to self-doubt. Their ideas made up a part of a larger cognitive revolution in psychological thinking that had occurred by the 1970s. Finally, humanistic psychology, the school of thought that gave rise to the human potential movement, emerged in the 1950s and 60s as a direct alternative to both psychoanalysis and behaviorism. It emphasized individual self-fulfillment and subjectivity, relativistic standards for behavior, and the presence in everyone of inner resources for change. Adherents of this philosophy said therapy should aim to remove obstacles, such as poor self-image or the denial of feelings, to self-development. Widely considered the guru of the human potential movement, Carl Rogers pioneered in client-centered therapy, a clinical technique in which therapists often repeat or rephrase what their clients say in order to help convey a feeling that clients are in charge of their fate. Popular in the 1950s and 1960s, it then waned dramatically and was widely lampooned later on. Frederick Perls's Gestalt therapy aimed to make patients aware of the feelings they genuinely harbored and to acknowledge those that were actually borrowed or adopted from others. He used highly confrontational exercises designed to force the patient to acknowledge the truth about his or her feelings. Gestalt therapy was popular in the 1960s and 70s, then largely faded from view as well. Transactional analysis conveyed to the public via the best-selling books Games People Play by Eric Byrne and I'm OK, You're OK by Thomas A. Harris sought to expose the part of the unconscious that was involved in a given social interaction, the child, parent, or adult, somewhat parallel to id, superego, and ego. Counselors helped clients analyze whether their transactions with others constituted genuine communication or social games that interfered with authentic interaction. Primal Scream was yet another therapy designed to heal a basic wound from childhood through uninhibited emotional expression, just one of a growing number of such therapies. It was this milieu that gave rise to the encounter group, with its unusual melange of ideas and practices. Like dynamic psychology, it stressed bringing into consciousness deep feelings, but at the same time sought to concentrate only on the here and now of Carl Rogers' humanistic therapy. Without going to deep roots in childhood, it attempted to resolve conflict through confrontational methods resembling Ellis's cognitive corrections and Pearls's gestalt therapy, and the encounter group constantly drew on behaviorist methods like role-playing. It rested on the assumption that individuals needed to unearth and confront their deepest feelings, but also on the assumption they could do so in a very compressed amount of time. Thus, people could undergo the kind of life-changing experiences over the course of a single weekend that would bring on a completely altered worldview in the way Beck thought possible. Encounters were based on the idea that honest and open communication of feelings, no matter how intense, would allow people to discover their authentic selves, break down barriers to communication with others, and enable them to choose which behaviors would fulfill them the most, all virtually overnight. This notion of an emergent consciousness undoubtedly owed some of its resonance to the long-term American revivalist tradition of the individual conversion experience, but was shorn of that tradition's crucial moral dimension. The Race Diagnosis one of the most important figures to popularize the notion that everyday experiences and tensions between blacks and whites could be explained in psychological terms and addressed with sensitivity training-like approaches was the black psychiatrist Price M. Cobbs. Cobbs co-authored the book Black Rage with the psychiatrist William H. Greer, also black. Their book appeared in 1968 to such acclaim that it became not only a bestseller at the time, but a widely read classic in the field of African American studies after that. Born in Los Angeles in 1928, Cobbs received a BA from the University of California at Berkeley in 1954, and an MD from Meharry Medical College in 1958. On the basis of their clinical work with blacks in psychotherapy, Greer and Cobbs described what they saw as the effects of racism on the lives of individuals. The tremendous anger and frustration they observed in their patients, they wrote, was the price blacks paid to live in a society that systematically oppressed them. The team went on to co-author another book, The Jesus Bag, which argued that religion had been employed as part of that oppression. Interestingly, after Black Rage, Cobbs turned his attention away from clinical practice with individuals to approaches using small groups, including diversity training seminars. As president of Pacific Management Systems, a consulting firm he founded in 1967, Cobbs conducted workshops on race relations initially in schools, police departments, social service agencies, and community organizations, and increasingly the business world. At first called racial confrontation groups, Cobbs' workshops set the groundwork for his participation in the field of diversity training. The books by Greer and Cobbs, and Cobbs' subsequent workshops, provide an invaluable illustration of the consequences of viewing race through the lens of psychology and using a therapeutic approach to interracial interactions. Black Rage mixes the notes taken by Greer and Cobbs on their psychiatric patients with excursions into history, sociology, psychology, and polemic that aim to explain the social factors the authors believe result in particular psychiatric disorders. Citing a variety of cases, from individuals with mild anxieties to those with full-blown diagnoses of schizophrenia, the book traces these disorders to white racism, something the authors considered all-pervasive. For black and white alike, the air of this nation is perfused, sick, with the idea of white supremacy. 
The authors traced current day neuroses and complexes, large and small, directly to slavery, even though they were writing more than a hundred years after emancipation. They believed that slavery created a set of interracial dynamics that led to a particular pathological mentality in slaves, and that those distorted psychological responses continued through the 1960s and would continue to exist after that, barring some revolutionary change. The book delivered a powerful attack on white racism. It was part of a series of invectives against racial discrimination and the systematic exploitation of black labor under slavery, the long-term effects of which were still evident in the 1960s, and to a lesser degree still are today. Like Cleaver's Soul on Ice, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, Black Rage was unrestrained in its condemnation of racism and unstinting in its articulation of the necessity of ending its effects. Like those books, Black Rage contained both implicit and explicit threats to whites that, if they did not bring an immediate end to white supremacy, they might be up against the fire next time. Greer and Cobbs laid out the specific situations of several of their psychiatric clients, analyzed their problems as a result of the prevailing social relations corrupted by racism, and suggested that the symptoms blacks exhibited constituted a kind of psychic time bomb just waiting to go off. As an example, Greer and Cobbs related the story of one young sergeant who had served in the military for ten years, three of those in combat, only to be subjected to an ugly racial incident. Returning to his small southern hometown, the young man accidentally found himself in a white neighborhood after drinking too much and falling asleep on a bus. When he asked a white man for help, that man in turn cried out for assistance, and another appeared with a gun. The police arrested the black man for attempted robbery, and he spent three hellish years in jail from which he never recovered. Ragged in appearance, he now had no residence and no steady job, only paranoid delusions that white men in the prison had somehow hypnotized him so that he heard strange voices. Greer and Cobbs saw the sergeant's decline as a direct effect of racism, and presented the story as a cautionary tale. To them the story bespoke the man's fall from a position of strength and promise. Imagine the sustained pressure required to induce or trigger a schizophrenic response in a vigorous young man who had functioned successfully as a soldier. This pressure must have offered him no chance of escape or even the hope of a chance. Yet Greer and Cobbs found that, even years later, sick through and through, when the sergeant came in for treatment, there was yet vigor and drive in his determination to get well. If he had not become a severe chronic paranoid schizophrenic, they wrote, consider for a moment what an enemy the white man almost had, a seasoned, resourceful, highly trained killer. Their threat took an even more direct form. If blacks are often frightened, consider what happens when they feel cornered, when there is no further lie one can believe, when one finally sees that he is permanently cast as the victim, and when finally the sleeping giant wakes and turns upon his tormentors. Politics Through Therapy As a fiery invective against the nation's inheritance of white supremacy, the force of black rage can still be felt. However, the terms in which Greer and Cobbs chose to express their social criticism and their image of a damaged collective psyche just about to explode into rage are what concern me here. Beyond the questions this way of appraising the causes of serious medical conditions of schizophrenia might raise, these psychiatrists' depiction of the problem, that black men and women suffered from various emotional afflictions resulting from social conditions, put their own enterprise into a strange light. If their patients' afflictions were not so much abnormal as appropriate responses to the many manifestations of racism they encountered, it would seem they would be in need less of therapy than of changed social conditions. The logical conclusion would be that political activists rather than therapists were the answer. Only political change would guide the nation out of the psychological morass described by Greer and Cobbs, a morass that included a number of overlapping symptoms they considered nearly universal among blacks, ranging wildly from paranoia to depression. However, Greer and Cobbs concluded that it was a kind of radical therapy of race relations that was needed. Activists like Greer and Cobbs sought to resolve this paradox through therapeutic intervention. They recast their professional work, in this case psychiatric practice, as social reform or even revolution. Greer and Cobbs implied that the psychological effects of racism, if left unattended, would continue to lead either to severely damaged psyches among blacks or to repressed hostility against whites. This festering hostility threatened to erupt at any moment. In fact, Greer and Cobbs thought that the race riots that were so prevalent in the mid-1960s were the inevitable result of white supremacy. Black rage implied that, if other avenues for catharsis were not found, the nation could expect much more violence and disorder. The catharsis hinted at in Black Rage would be a racialized therapy, which Cobbs developed later, with different roles for whites and blacks. Notably, Greer and Cobbs' conclusion was based on an argument against racial discrimination that rested not on religious, moral, or political rationales for social justice, but on psychological ones. The historian Daryl Scott has recently explored the distinctiveness of this point of view in his impressive genealogy of the idea of the damaged black psyche, or the use of damage imagery, both by those who hoped to preserve the status quo and by those who sought to improve conditions for African Americans. Scott believes the cost of this approach is enormous. By single-mindedly focusing on the negative psychological effects of racism, racial liberals paved the way for conservatives to use those same concepts of black pathology to argue for blacks' inherent or temporary inferiority.
While Scott's admirable study brings our attention to the dangers of damage imagery to the cause of racial equality, dismissing any and all evocations of the idea that racism has caused psychological damage does not reflect the ways in which racism has obviously inflicted at least some such damage. Furthermore, the imagery of damage cannot fully characterize what was so lethal about enlisting psychology for the cause of civil rights. The replacement of the religious or moral arguments for equality, with ones based on the psychological disorders of discriminatory institutions, altered not only the means by which change could be seen to come about, but also the ends themselves. The desired goal was no longer civic equality and participation, but individual psychic well-being. This psychological state was much more nebulous, open to interpretation, difficult to achieve, and controversial than the universal guarantees of political equality sought by the early civil rights movement. What is more, the movement for psychic betterment involved an interpersonal project that spawned many new problems of its own. Perhaps most important, Black Rage exhibits the overarching preoccupation with repression for which its age became known. Cries for black liberation, women's liberation, sexual liberation, gay liberation, and the liberation of colonial people, just as a start, were not only simultaneous but often seen as one. Criticism of the larger repressiveness of society potentially undermined the assertion that white racism was the culprit for the strictures on black expressiveness. But Greer and Cobbs were determined to see inhibitions in racial terms alone. They delivered a particularly strong attack, for instance, on a personality they deemed afflicted by the postal clerk syndrome. Not the same syndrome that came into currency later with the phrase going postal. The postal clerk syndrome was merely another way of describing the stereotypically passive black toady, yes man, or Uncle Tom. Granting the limitations of stereotypes, Greer and Cobbs still went on to sketch a paradigmatic black man. Quote, this man is always described as nice by white people. In whatever integrated setting he works, he is the standard against whom other blacks are measured. He is passive, non-assertive, and non-aggressive. He has made a virtue of identification with the aggressor, and he has adopted an ingratiating and compliant manner. He is a direct lineal descendant of the house who was designed to identify totally with the white master. As an example of this kind of person, Greer and Cobb cited the husband of one of their patients. The patient herself suffered from such melancholia that she had tried repeatedly to commit suicide, but it was her calm and well-mannered husband, a leading Negro citizen, who came under the scrutiny and ultimately disapproval of Greer and Cobbs, to the point where they seemed to suggest that the root of the wife's depression was her husband's reticence. The wife was angry with her husband and berated him for never opening up and exposing his feelings, they wrote. Quote, for his part, the husband remained nice. He never raised his voice above a murmur. His wife could goad him, but he was the epitome of understanding. He was amenable to all suggestions. His manner and gestures were deliberate, studied, and non-inflammatory. Everything was understated. During the course of treatment, he was involved in several civil rights crises. His public life was an extension of his private one, and he used such words as moderation and responsibility. His entire life was a study in passivity, and how to play at being a man without really being one. Greer and Cobbs went on to explain that this man could not be dismissed as just an isolated passive individual, but had instead to be seen as someone who tried to conceal his drive. Predictably, the next paragraph invoked slavery to explain that black men had to discover expressive forms that did not threaten whites, so they invented the posture of playing it cool. Greer and Cobbs saw this style as resulting from a fear of the eruption of repressed feelings and the swift punishment that would result. They interpreted the symptoms they observed among their patients, such as weeping without feeling, to be the exorbitant cost and suffering inflicted from emotional repression. Many male patients cited incidents in which they witnessed a triumphant man, whether it was a speech by Martin Luther King Jr. or someone else's moment of personal glory, perhaps an athlete's triumph, and felt tears begin to well up in their eyes but with no attendant thoughts or feelings. Greer and Cobbs interpreted this as a result of a man's not allowing himself the forbidden feelings of sadness for what he might have been. But white racism had commanded him not to excel, not to achieve, not to become outstanding, not to draw attention to himself, to remain anonymous. While one can surely detect a generalized portrait of victimization in this line of thought, along with the concentration on the pathological effects of racism, what has gone the most awry in such an interpretation, what rings false, is its single-minded focus on race as a key to an entire personality structure, and beyond that, the key to the personality structure of a whole group of people. Even more, tracing the entire racial experience to slavery caused black rage to draw conclusions about symptoms among blacks in the 1960s according to the master-slave dynamic of a century before, and to a set of uncomplicated and unexamined assumptions about the dynamic at that. The notion of a unique black self represented a continuation of differential or racialist thinking. From this set of assumptions, however, Greer and Cobbs went on to prescribe what they thought was needed to address this psychopathology. Rather than fighting politically to end any last vestiges of social inequality, the psychiatrists proposed new therapies. They called for a psychiatric revolution, a profound convulsion of society that would address the contempt and hatred of black people that is so thoroughly a part of the American personality.
Therapists were ideally situated to be in the vanguard of the struggle because of their love for their patients. Because, besides therapists, how many people, black or white, can so open their arms to a suffering black man? The new racial therapy one gleans from Black Rage should have several dimensions. First, directly in line with the sensitivity training group's self-referential obsession with feedback, racial therapy should demand that therapists themselves turn inward. It is not enough just to increase the number of black therapists, for a black therapist whose manner mimics the tentative hands-off approach of a reluctant white therapist is of no help to blacks. The black clinician's own inevitable problems of identification, combined with the disengaged white milieu in which he was trained, make it difficult for him to be comfortable with his blackness, enough to offer real help, unless he begins to grapple with his own feelings about being black, ineffective, and victimized in a powerful white nation. Second, Greer and Cobbs sought to enter a plea for clinical clinicians, who can differentiate the traits necessary for survival under white racism from real mental disorders, who can tell the difference between a sick man and a sick nation. To practice effectively, clinicians who are interested in the psychological functioning of black people must get acquainted with what the authors called the black norm. A level of paranoia, depression, masochism, and lack of respect for white men's laws is part of normal adaptation to being black in America. Greer and Cobbs put forth a formula to help therapists supply this knowledge. To find the amount of sickness a black man has, one must first total all that appears to represent illness and then subtract the black norm. What remains is illness and a proper subject for therapeutic behavior. Traits that would be considered disorders in others thus become norms for blacks, not only understandable but justifiable adaptive behaviors. To regard the black norm as pathological and attempt to remove such traits by treatment would be akin to analyzing away a hunter's cunning or a banker's prudence. Greer and Cobbs ended this discussion with a contradiction. Too much psychotherapy involves striving only for change in the inner world, rather than for a change of the social order, yet a good therapist can help a patient more effectively change his outer world. So, while the authors seemed to admit the limits of clinical therapy, they still held to a therapeutic approach to the larger social context they saw as the root of many of the emotional problems of blacks. The roles of the sympathetic therapist and emotional disclosure remain paramount. Quote, the essential ingredient is the capacity of the therapist to love his patient, to say to him that here is a second chance to organize his inner life, to say that you have a listener and companion who wants you to make it. If you must weep, I'll wipe your tears. If you must hit someone, hit me. I can take it. I will, in fact, do anything to help you be what you can be. My love for you is of such an order. While alluding to Martin Luther King Jr.'s belief in agape, or love of community, which King described as a love for a higher purpose that transcends individuals and could move blacks and whites from division and bitterness to the beloved community, Greer and Cobbs cast this love completely in therapeutic terms. Rather than a love of something outside individuals that bonds them together, this love of the therapist embraces the individual against the outside world. Therapeutic love does not call on individuals to triumph in their inner moral wars against evil, but encourages them to reveal their weaknesses in order that they be accepted unconditionally. The unleashing of the emotions, rather than mastery of them, constitutes progress. This is not the theory that drove civil rights, but the one that drove the countercultural and human potential movement's revolt against the supposed repression of the authentic self and its unbounded needs for fulfillment. At the same time Cobbs was formulating his ideas for Black Rage, he was becoming increasingly involved in the human potential movement. When he was first approached to participate in this therapeutic movement, his response showed that he saw it as removed from the black movement. The irony is that he eventually was one of those responsible for connecting the two movements and helping to steer the black movement in a new direction. Racial Confrontation as Transcendental Experience Cobbs's involvement in the human potential movement seems to have originated in an invitation by George Leonard to conduct interracial workshops at one of the most famous growth centers, the SLN Institute, founded in the early 1960s in Big Sur, California, a stunning coastal town south of Monterey. Leonard, a white southerner who served as vice president of SLN starting in 1966, had become an integrationist after serving in the Army Air Force in World War II and had gone on to participate in school desegregation and civil rights marches. He later attributed his involvement in the human relations movement to his growing awareness of racial discrimination. In a 1983 history of SLN called The Upstart Spring, Walter Truett Anderson, a freelance writer on politics and culture, wrote about Leonard. Having discovered that his society and its authority figures could be wrong on something as important as race, he remained open to the possibility that they could be wrong on other subjects as well. Leonard believed that he and other visionaries, such as SLN's president and co-founder, with Richard Price, Michael Murphy, with their unbounded criticism for the possibilities for human growth and education through innovative types of experience, were riding the crest of a great social transformation. Worried about the race riots of the mid-1960s, Leonard included in his vision for this vast transformation a change in American race relations. According to Anderson, Leonard first discovered Cobbs when he read a newspaper article that detailed the problems that the black psychiatrist and his wife had faced in moving to an all-white neighborhood in San Francisco. 
Leonard called the story to the attention of his editor at Look Magazine, where his own article about the human potential movement had appeared in 1964. In the process of getting Look to run an article on the situation, Leonard, Cobbs, and their families developed a friendship. Then Leonard asked Cobbs whether he would conduct interracial workshops. Anderson writes that Cobbs' initial reaction to the idea of conducting an interracial encounter group was ambivalence. Apparently, Cobbs even worried that Leonard's motive was to have a suitable black friend to demonstrate his own liberalism. Later, Cobbs accepted the idea that his friend was involved in SLN. For his own part, Cobbs viewed it as a playground of middle-class white dilettantes. Even after agreeing to conduct a workshop with Leonard, he nearly canceled in order to attend the New York Black Power Convention set for the same weekend. Price Cobbs and George Leonard conducted their first encounter group at SLN in July 1967, while Cobbs was at work on Black Rage, which would be published the following year. In Leonard's Education and Ecstasy, also published in 1968, Leonard revealed that the impetus behind the workshop idea lay not just in interracial tensions, but also in the utopian belief that SLN methods could diffuse or at least alter them. Since so much of SLN is truly experimental, Leonard wrote, nothing can be guaranteed to work, yet most people who participate come away with the conviction that they have somehow been changed. SLN experiments shared a characteristic sense of hope for solving even the most intractable human problems. At a time when the blood and fire of race riots were becoming regular features of American summers, one could certainly have argued that one of the most intractable problems of all was race relations. While the Black Power Conference took place in New York, with more than 400 representatives of 45 civil rights groups, some 35 individuals gathered at SLN for an interracial workshop entitled Racial Confrontation as Transcendental Experience. The brochure cast the racial problem as a matter of individual alienation and integration as a predominantly psychological project. The goal of the workshop was an interpersonal encounter that was free of inauthentic inhibitions, a form of collective transcendence. The publicity for the event read, Racial segregation exists among people with divided selves. A person who is alien to some part of himself is invariably separated from anyone who represents that alien part. The historic effort to integrate black man and white has involved us all in a vast working out of our divided human nature. Racial confrontation can be seen as an example for all kinds of human encounter. When it goes deep enough, past superficial niceties and role-playing, it can be a vehicle for transcendental experience. Leonard later admitted that such language was hyperbolic, and that, as the weekend began, he and Cobbs were nervous. However, Leonard recalled that they had been motivated by a sense that something had to be done, quote, to show a way, even if a small one, through the racial impasse that had almost brought the civil rights movement to a halt. Leonard spelled out this impasse, as he saw it, in the terms of the encounter movement. The Black Power militants screamed their hurt, anger, and hatred. By revealing themselves and voicing the truth, they begged for encounter. The white leaders responded with conventional language, revealing nothing of their own feelings. As a result of their emotional pain in this line of thought, blacks and whites alike sorely needed the therapy the encounter method could provide. Both blacks and whites, according to the encounter group philosophy, required emotional release, though of different emotions. Leonard thought blacks needed to release their anger, and whites their racism and fears. In the absence of such release, stilted phony behavior typified into racial settings. Quote, How could there be understanding without self-revelation? Didn't the whites feel outrage, fear, repressed prejudice? The measured judicious response seemed to us a lie. Nor was there real encounter in the biracial committees set up in some cities. Blacks and whites sat around tables, mouthed slogans, established positions, and made decisions of an intellectual and political nature. They generally left the meetings unchanged. Little education took place. What would happen when we ventured into the dangerous territory where nothing is hidden? What happened, as Anderson put it, in Upstart Spring, was a heavy weekend. The group consisted of 35 participants and the three facilitators, Leonard, Cobbs, and Cobbs's wife, Vad. Whites outnumbered blacks, and black men outnumbered black women, and some Asians participated. The mostly middle-class group had many professionals, including therapists and teachers. The session was a weekend marathon, which meant that participants met Friday evening, broke for the night, resumed the session on Saturday morning, and continued on until Sunday noon, with only a break for meals and a visit to the natural hot springs, a big attraction of SLN. This schedule meant participants did not sleep Saturday night, which was often the case in the encounter experience. The assumption was that deprivation of the usual comforts might also strip people of their unneeded inhibitions. Leonard gave a vivid description of the encounter group in Education and Ecstasy, which Cobbs later said was told brilliantly. On Friday night, Cobbs and Leonard opened the weekend by having participants sit in a circle in a rustic meeting room, warmed against the cool sea air by candlelight and open fire, introducing the weekend's plan and leading the group through introductions. Participants' introductions, in Leonard's eyes, involved pat accounts of their reasons for attending the seminar, Accounts that would be, like everything else, subject to intense scrutiny by the end of the encounter.
Next came an exercise called a microlab, a technique of William Schutz's designed to elicit the quickest possible expression of feelings. Separated into four separate circles, participants received instruction in the encounter rules. 1. Be completely honest and open. Forget about conventional politeness and reserve. Express anything you wish, no matter how shocking it may seem. 2. Relate on the level of feelings. Don't theorize or rationalize. 3. Stay in the here and now. Don't escape into past events or future plans. Only one prohibition. No physical violence, please. Then the conversation began. Initially, this conversation was nothing more than the kind of chatter you hear at cocktail parties. Cobbs and Leonard stopped the activity after only a few minutes, inaugurating the running self-analysis for which the tea group was known. The facilitators had listened in on the four groups and heard some unconstructive tendencies, which they had thought had to be displayed and halted before any fruitful work could begin. The resort to humor, charm, excursions into personal history regarding race, or intellectual abstraction was nothing but a cop-out, a way of evading prickly emotions in the present. Chastened, the groups returned to their work with greater seriousness, but still fell back on facial expressions that cushioned the impact of their words in order to avoid inflicting pain. Leonard and Cobbs thus stopped the discussion and moved on to the next exercise. Here, each group stood in a circle, and one at a time, members stopped in front of each other person in the circle, looked the person in the eye, touched the person in some honest way, and told the person what they felt about him in that moment. Next, the group sat and communicated for ten minutes silently. Most participants held hands. Complete dialogues transpired without words, Leonard wrote later. People learned. Finally, the group stood and moved closer together. Most put their arms around the other's shoulders. Sitting again, they were to express true here-and-now feelings in anything from words to sounds or touch. Entirely departed was the cocktail party chatter. A few barriers had been crossed, and a few eyes were moist with the wonder or relief that often accompanies such crossings. However, on Saturday, this closeness shattered. Real confrontations broke out, initially among blacks, who hurled the terms racist, Uncle Tom, and Fink and exposed the games that black people played, such as the militant game, the middle-class brother game, the hip dude out to make the white chicks game. This viciousness was taken as a sign that the activities had devolved into mere accusation, not true encounter. The long marathon session of the weekend began after lunch, with part of the group engaging in a sensory awakening activity outdoors, in which, with their eyes closed, participants touched the others to communicate and get to know them directly, without racial stereotypes, since such stereotypes presumably originated in feelings about physical differences, and physical differences were mainly detected through sight. Noises from this activity could be heard outdoors, including loud sobbing and wailing. Inside, a confrontation had broken out between Cliff, a personable light-skinned Negro, and a beautiful young white schoolteacher named Pam. Pam told Cliff she wanted to be his friend, but Cliff rejected her pitiful, condescending overtures, whereupon she pleaded tearfully, "'Please, what can I do? I'm trying. Please help me.' Cliff replied, "'No, baby, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to take you off the hook. I want you to feel just what I feel. I want you to feel what I've felt for twenty-one years. Go on, cry.' Silence followed becoming in itself a powerful medium of communication. We began to know each other, Leonard wrote. Black-white confrontation dominated the session going into Saturday night. The focus at that point was the Negroes' hurt and anger and despair, their absolute distrust of all whites. Leonard received an exemption when Cobbs said that he did trust Leonard, something always wished for in the hot and heavy of an encounter, but regretted afterwards, presumably because it got in the way of facing the universality of black rage and white racism. If so regretted, however, it is interesting that Leonard included this detail in his account. More pleasing to Leonard seemed to be one black woman's bitter response to his suggestion that whites too faced misfortunes. I just can't buy that. Whatever's wrong with you, you can do something about. But I can't do anything about the color of my skin or my children's. Compared to us, you've got it made. Spleen poured out, and the mood of the whites was one of deepening despair. One white woman said, My best friend of 15 years is a Negro, and I had no idea she felt these kind of things, and now I know she does and has just been keeping them from me to spare me. I don't want to go back home. I'm afraid to see my friend. I don't see how the race problem can ever be solved. Leonard's response was that he was glad it was all coming out in the open, since the race problem could certainly never be solved so long as we didn't know and feel and experience the truth. The climax of the Esalen encounter came when a young man in his twenties, almost jet black, and with a body as taut as a steel spring, announced to the group that he had moved beyond the issue of race. He continued that he lacked all wrath against whites, refused to believe incidents of racism were widespread, and had rarely experienced racism himself. Incredulous, the group unified, even Cliff and Pam, against him, trying to get through to Chuck. Leonard himself, at someone's suggestion, fulfilled his urge to yell at Chuck. Nothing had any effect on Chuck, who continued to profess nothing but good feelings. Later in the session, however, Chuck also claimed he had extraordinary sexual prowess. I could take any woman here. How would you take Pam, I asked him. I'll tell you. Tell her. He turned toward the teacher. All right. First I'd wrap you, then I'd take you. Wrap? 
talk, you know, establish rapport. I'd rap you, and then I'd take you. This did not go over well with Pam, who said, You'd never take me. I wouldn't let you touch me. Ever. A black woman chimed in, likewise, that Chuck had no chance of sleeping with her, adding, And I'm going to tell you why. Because you're just a dirty little black <laughs> This triggered a violent response. Quote, Chuck almost leaped from his chair. Clenching his fists on the armrests, he loosed his sudden fury in a savage and frightening tirade. Finally, he caught himself, looked around the room with dazed eyes, and covered his face with his hands. He sat that way as members of the group comforted him. Then he looked up and smiled. Later on, Chuck said, I want to thank all of you. I have learned more in the last two hours than in the last two years. After breakfast on Sunday, the session completely changed direction, as whites began pouring out the tragedies of their own lives. This started when a white woman said that she dated only black men, and when pushed, cried and admitted she had given up on white men. At this point, the group stopped accusing her of white liberal trickery, and a black woman went over to comfort her with a hug. And the Negroes wept for the whites, wrote Leonard. Without question of race, they felt, they knew. One after another, the revelations poured forth. The group took on a life of its own. There were no leaders now. We were all swept along. As tragedies poured forth, the tears flowed. Almost everyone in the room was crying. We were unashamed of our tears. For many of us, that morning was transcendental. At 1.30, the dining room crew came and told us we would have to go. We rose and moved, without a word, to the center of the room in a mass, moist-eyed embrace. Anderson wrote that Leonard, Cobbs, and Vad exulted at the way the session had achieved the resolution that was not given in encounter groups, some of which never broke through, but only broke up. Late that night, Anderson wrote, Cobbs called Leonard and said, George, we've got to take this to the world. Cobbs and Leonard went on to conduct interracial encounter groups throughout the SLN Center in San Francisco, sponsored in part by the Episcopal Diocese of California. Two black psychology students, Ron Brown and Michael Brown, no relation, assisted in the technique. Anderson's assessment was that they were extremely successful. Those participating in the interracial encounter work became so close that they gathered for a picnic a week after Martin Luther King was assassinated, while much of the rest of the country was torn by racial conflict. A turning point, however, occurred shortly thereafter when a crisis, not without its ironies, caused the program to implode. Real life, not according to protocol. Ron Brown, who helped run the interracial encounter groups, triggered the crisis when he pushed for more money than the standard $125 both the white and the black leaders received for running a session, according to Anderson's account. As Brown started his appeal over the phone, an administrator of San Francisco Esalen, Bill Smith, allegedly replied, fuck you, and hung up. When Brown rushed over to Smith's office, Smith said he would call the police. Shit, I was just doing some confrontation, Brown told his friends, Anderson wrote. Confrontation was the big thing around SLN, he said. People were shouting at people all the time, but nobody ever said, I'll call the police. Ron Brown and Price Cobbs interpreted the threat to call the police as a racial slur and demanded an apology from Smith, whose unwillingness to give one seemed to some to be possible grounds for removal from his job. Instead, Leonard and Cobbs proposed an encounter group session to deal with the difficulty. Michael Murphy, who was in New York City, traveled all the way back to Cobbs' office in San Francisco to participate in the group of five other whites and three blacks, all male. One woman had driven up from Big Sur, but was allegedly told this encounter was about racism, not sexism, and was kept from attending. Other tensions simmered below the surface because the San Francisco contingent thought their interracial group approach lacked support at the SLN at Big Sur. In Anderson's telling, Bill Smith, the target of the allegations, tearfully protested against them in a conversation with Murphy before the encounter, denying that he harbored racist feelings and talking about his participation in the civil rights movement. Reluctant to participate in the encounter group in the first place, Smith was predictably lambasted. Less predictably, Smith held his ground. Anderson went on, quote, People yelled and got angry. Murphy lost his temper and tried to tell them about what Smith had done on behalf of civil rights. The blacks didn't want to listen to that. That was old stuff that always came up in the encounter groups, whites protesting that they were free of racism. The blacks wanted some concession from Smith that he was not free of racism, that there had been racist overtones to his treatment of Brown. Smith wouldn't give in. It had been, he insisted, just a conflict between two people. Smith stayed in the midst of the angry group for approximately an hour, and then, under the pretense of going to the restroom, left the session. Members of the group who remained achieved a vague consensus that Smith should have to go on a retreat at Big Sur. Then they went out for drinks. Meanwhile, Smith phoned Richard Price, who interpreted the effort as one in a series of power plays in Esalen, and later told Murphy not to cave into pressure. Murphy, in turn, called Leonard and proposed a milder approach toward Smith. He would have breakfast with Smith daily and be sure there were no further incidents. Feeling let down because the encounter group had reached a different decision, Leonard resigned as vice president of SLN. Anderson wrote that this ended the interracial encounters. Smith was fired a few months later by Murphy. Cobbs and other interracial leaders left SLN, but they continued the style of work inaugurated there in their interracial work with organizations. The incident, in retrospect, serves as an example of a social script that emerged in the 1960s radical milieu and went on to have a life of its own in the subsequent anti-racist movement.
Brown's assertiveness apparently gave way quickly to anger, perfectly fitting Cobbs' notion that legitimate rage always lies just below the surface of Black's personality, ready to spring on the white oppressor. Smith, in turn, seemed to refuse to give in to the demonstration of rage, acknowledge his guilt, and confess to having been motivated by racism in denying Brown the raise and threatening to call the police. Perhaps this departure from the script stymied those involved. The encounter group sought to reduce tensions by allowing all of the explosive emotions to be let out. By permitting those involved to express themselves freely and openly, the activity aimed to transcend everyday problems by moving participants to a new plane on which they could encounter one another in a completely authentic fashion. But the notion of the authentic expression of emotion was by no means as free of social and political pressures as proponents of encounter groups thought. The encounter group, in fact, helped define the authentic black and white emotional reality, when stripped of all artificial social convention and pretension, to be rage and guilt, respectively. The interracial encounter at Esalen collapsed when Smith would not act according to the new script and admit to hidden racist proclivities. This insistence that whites were only authentic when they admitted to their racism translated into a truism of the subsequent anti-racism movement. Any white person, and eventually in some versions any individual at all, who did not admit to being racist was in denial of a basic truth about his or her inner self. Likewise, blacks who failed to conform to the dictates of the new black rage were suspected of being alienated from their own feelings. Ethnotherapy After Cobbs left SLN, he continued to conduct interracial encounter groups. In the early 1970s, he and other group leaders conducted over 100 groups involving some 1,400 individuals at the University of California at San Francisco Medical Center, funded by a research grant. In a 1972 article, Cobbs spelled out a clinical model he claimed could transform racial attitudes. He called the technique ethnotherapy. He explicitly traced his own efforts to his awareness of the T group and laboratory method and the great work of Kurt Lewin, which was a foundation for his own. Cobbs bowed to Lewin's method, but said that Lewin's interest in social action had faded after the inauguration of tea groups in the late 1940s, when the proliferating encounter groups focused more on individual growth and sensory exploration than on fighting prejudice. Cobbs also made a point of distinguishing his own efforts from group therapy. He saw the encounter group as innovative because it encouraged normals to participate in groups without fear of being labeled medically sick. It was this distinction between the tea group and group therapy, already practiced since the early 20th century, that ironically allowed Cobbs and others to treat what they saw as the disease of racism in the population at large. Describing his practice of ethnotherapy, Cobbs argued for the infusion of race into therapeutic practice on the grounds that continuing racism still caused a festering wound for blacks. Blacks needed the encounter group in order to express and come to terms with their anger at whites, and whites needed it to confront their own racism. Cobbs argued firmly that racism was a disease, likening it to tuberculosis, alcoholism, and drug addiction in its disastrous effects, and therefore that it demanded the same kind of group therapy used to treat victims of those diseases. Citing the group research used by Alcoholics Anonymous, he called racial confrontation necessary for the changing of attitudes. Cobbs' description of the typical ethnotherapy session, or racial confrontation group, bore the Esalen imprint. Ethnotherapy groups took place over two full days, usually over a weekend, in groups of about 12 to 14, with roughly half of the participants women and half of them blacks. The technique entailed the same emphasis on the here and now, instant intimacy, intense emotional expression, and the stripping of one's defenses that were emphasized at SLN. This emphasis would permit total disclosure of the misguided feelings and attitudes regarding race that could then come under analysis so that participants could jar loose, dissect, and examine in fine detail the misinformation underlying them. Cobbs's workshops began with a discussion of their own purpose, and moved to personal introductions by the participants. Then commenced the racial and personal exploration phase, during which people discussed questions such as what being black or white means to them personally, and what thoughts and feelings come up when they consider themselves in light of social definitions of who is acceptable and non-acceptable in this country. Next, a period called black exploration had only blacks talking about race while whites listened, followed by black-white confrontation. Initial polarization eventually turned into a halting conversation, then slowly gave way to the total unveiling of intimate experiences and intense sharing of private secrets and pain. This flood of repressed emotions, intensified and made contagious by the dynamics of a small group, constituted the final stage, the actual ethnotherapy. In this later description of his method, Cobbs made very clear the premise of the work, which rested on the idea that small group confrontation would raise participants' awareness of the role of racism in their lives. While he warned of the potential dangers inherent in the unleashing of pent-up emotions, clearly it is exactly this unleashing that formed the crux of ethnotherapy. Therapy relied on participants' total honesty and openness, which Cobbs thought was the only method of bringing into the open attitudes embedded deep in the psyche. Finally, true honesty would bring out black rage and white guilt, without which expression there would be no progress. 
An even deeper set of assumptions underlay those premises. Therapy was needed as the main way to deal with racial tensions. Small group confrontation of this highly personal sort, guided by trained leaders, was the optimal method to carry out this therapy. Positive change in race relations was primarily a matter of technique. The ends were self-explanatory, and ordinary people required therapy as much as those who were designated mentally ill by society. Over the course of this process, Cobb said, leaders could come to expect several typical patterns in the ways whites responded to the rage of blacks. Early in the workshop, a black person inevitably attacked a white person, who responded with anguish. Automatically assuming that all whites harbor hidden racist proclivities, he dismissed this peculiar sensitivity of whites as a form of denial. Objections to the virulence of blacks' attacks and to accusations that whites hold hateful attitudes only proved whites' alienation from their own feelings. Cobbs went on to describe the response of the blacks in the group, who counterattack first with disbelief, then anger. Inside, blacks thought, how can you take us to be such fools? But outwardly they responded, we know from long and bitter experience with whites that all are foes, that you in this room have the very same thoughts as the rest of the bastards. Why don't you own up to it? We already know. We know not by the words you speak, but by your actions toward us. Cobbs concluded that the blacks are stunned as they realize that whites really believe the lies they tell themselves, and that blacks share belief in many of those lies. Cobbs saw racism as a disease so pervasive in society that no American was immune from its ravages. Whites continually tried to gain exemptions from inclusion in the class of bigots, for instance, by citing their civil rights work, as Smith had done in the SLN fiasco, or by resorting to other forms of denial. Cobbs's virulent attack on this denial surfaces as a rare example of transcripted dialogue of his therapeutic response and action. Jane, I don't relate towards you, toward color or anything else. I relate towards every single person here as an individual. Cobbs, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying. Jane, why? Cobbs, if I would say, you look like a little boy to me, I just don't see anything, you'd say I was crazy because you're a woman. If I could neutralize you in some way, this is exactly what white folks do to black folks. I don't see any color. How in the hell can you not see his color? So stop lying. The All-Black Encounter Group, The Interpersonal is Political The same year Cobbs proclaimed his development of the new model of ethnotherapy, other practitioners called the possibilities for applying sensitivity training methods to problems faced by blacks exciting, challenging, and frightening. Robert E. Steele, MPH, and Kermit B. Nash, MSW, published a paper they had delivered at the 1971 Annual Meeting of the American Orthopsychiatric Association in Washington, D.C., in that organization's journal, entitled Sensitivity Training in the Black Community. While Cobb stressed the need for interracial confrontation, Steele and Nash criticized the sensitivity training movement for not addressing the tensions within the black community. Instead, current sensitivity training practice tended to employ black participants in order to alleviate guilt for whites, and thus had little relevance beyond the middle class. Steele and Nash thought small group encounters were much more appropriate for intergroup discussion, whereas interracial problems resulted more from institutional racism and interpersonal dynamics and should thus be dealt with differently. Yet their ideas of what blacks needed from encounter groups paralleled Cobbs's closely. The authors argued that sensitivity training needed to confront the emotional imprisonment of institutionalized black self-hatred, which they considered universal. Here they drew on the study of the psychologists Kenneth and Mamie Clark, in which black youngsters expressed a preference for white dolls over black ones. The Clarks thought the study showed the ways that racial discrimination had damaged the children's self-esteem, and lawyers in the Brown v. Board of Education case in 1954 used the study to argue against segregated schools. Steele and Nash proposed a black behavioral model for sensitivity training that rested on an assumption that racism had likewise emasculated black men. As a result of internalizing the demeaning stereotypes of blacks under white supremacy, blacks had adopted a castrating type of adaptive passivity that encourages non-assertive, antisocial, self-destructive behavior on the part of the black male. This passivity directly denied the inherent human emotional requirement of self-assertion or aggression, which in turn led to low achievement, powerlessness, and problems within the black community which could range from male-female recriminations to homicide. These authors prescribed sensitivity training to address this self-destructive behavior and the damaging attitudes in the black community, and to inaugurate personal growth and the improvement of self-esteem. Like Cobbs, Steele and Nash thought the crux of sensitivity training for blacks should involve the release of anger. Many sensitivity trainers aimed at establishing a saccharine, idyllic, womb-like state, but the situation of blacks in particular demanded the release of negative, hostile, or angry feelings, and only bona fide anger at that. Sensitivity trainers working with blacks needed not only to be able to express and to deal with anger, but also differentiate real from artificial rage. Trainers had to get beyond the cool front and well-rehearsed games most blacks played, since we blacks are accomplished con artists. Steele and Nash advocated breaking down this front through activities such as role-playing and nonverbal exercises. One example was the common tug-of-war exercise, in which equal segments of the group on opposite sides of the room pulled at an individual standing in the middle. In the example the author cited, one side took the Tom and won the militant perspective in order to explore ideological conflict among blacks. 
Another example was the fishbowl exercise, in which an individual sat on a chair between two others, representing his alter egos, one in the role of the middle-class black individual, and the other in the role of the black nationalist. Steele and Nash disapproved of the emphasis on ideology over competence, stressing the need for trainers who were not blinded by ideological rhetoric. Yet they also wrote approvingly that the black power movement has had great psychotherapeutic value, and that sensitivity training should support the positive aspects of black power, or it might become counter-revolutionary. Sensitivity training could build confidence and a sense of efficacy for a group by permitting the psychological safety that was necessary for the breaking free from old behavior patterns. Through interaction in the group and feedback on behavior, individuals could locate what habits should be changed. Steele and Nash believed that the sense of trust and efficacy developed in the group could be translated into action outside the group aimed at community betterment. They thought the continuing problems of the black community included economic and social conditions that needed to be addressed. The approach of Steele and Nash brought many of the contradictions of the sensitivity training approach to race to the fore. They blamed several discrete entities for black's problems, a dysfunctional black personality entailing passivity and self-hatred, institutional white racism, disruptive and destructive black behavior, and social and economic conditions. They prescribed the black power movement's pro-black emphasis, the heightening of individual self-esteem, collective trust building, and self-confidence as a program for bringing about change. This kind of diffuse, multi-causal interpretation of blacks' remaining problems paved the way for a nebulous set of beliefs about what small group activity could achieve and how. The result was a confused blend of an older tradition of small group mobilization for social reform with a newer therapeutic notion of the small group as a prime locus for personal growth. As is well known, the use of small group organizations to forge civic-mindedness and larger political and social reforms was common in the 19th and early 20th centuries, its movements ranging from abolitionism to progressivism. In the first half of the 20th century, many movements for social reform as diverse as the Settlement House movement and the Civil Rights movement drew on the potential for small group activities to develop a sense of individual efficacy crucial to further civic involvement and social change. What we see in the small group activities of the late 1960s, dedicated to the amelioration of racial problems, is the infusion of this tradition with new emphasis on therapy for the individual, which in turn reflected the shift in the T-group movement from group dynamics to personal growth. The concern with personal growth never replaced the concern with group dynamics, rather they came to be seen as intrinsically connected. On the one hand, the building of self-esteem was recast as one goal, when not recast as the goal, of improved group dynamics. On the other, improved group dynamics would occur only through individual growth through various forms of therapy. At the same time, the group dynamics movement had helped equate changes in group dynamics with social changes. Although it has been well documented that the story of 1960s and 70s reform was the new popularization of the idea that the personal was political, the restating of this equation fails to get us beneath the surface of the reform milieu of the time. More revealing is a look at how and why reformers thought the personal became political. Not only did they rightly believe that even the intensely private reaches of personal experience could be affected by political, often equated with power, arrangements, which thus demanded political redress, but many of them also confused the project of self-development, recast as personal growth through the new therapies, with political action. The idea that small groups could provide a laboratory in which to study social dynamics and ways to improve them in microcosm gave way to the idea that individual healing was itself a social and political project that could be achieved in the small group. While some, like Steele and Nash, still spoke of a personal self-esteem and the efficacious group that allowed it to flourish as a means to an end, revitalize black neighborhoods and social and economic quality and power, Others came to use the new equation of the political and the personal realms as a rationale for viewing individual change through small groups as the end of reform. The self-esteem movement, for example, seized on the notion of the psychological damage wrought by social hierarchy and brutality. Mistaking cause and effect, it cast heightened self-esteem as the goal of reform, thus enshrining personal reform and imbuing it with higher connotations, as though it automatically had an implicit social and political dimension. Concern with self-image, personal motivation, and therapy ultimately displaced concern with increased personal efficacy aimed at civic participation and social change. The premise that the small group is political was apparent in another little-known attempt to apply T groups to race relations, the encounter tape. By means of this method, one could conduct encounter groups in the absence of a leader by using audio tape recordings. It is revealing as a harbinger of the support group as well as the use of motivational tapes, both do-it-yourself therapies that came into widespread use in the late 20th century. Betty Burzon, an encounter group enthusiast of the 60s and early 70s, worked extensively since at least the mid-60s on the idea of the leaderless or self-directed group. In the early 70s, she wrote about applying this method to race relations. Leaderless Encounter Groups Betty Burzon's ideas about the self-directed group drew on research she conducted with Lawrence N. Solomon, a psychologist who also pioneered in encounter groups in the early 1960s at the Western Behavioral Sciences Institute.
In their program, adult volunteers, clients in a vocational rehabilitation program, met regularly with only a therapist on call in another room. They believed that this approach could allow many who would never encounter a professional mental health worker to experience personal growth, which could help them at work. Despite admitting that not much was actually accomplished, Burzon and Solomon maintained that such groups were feasible. After two initial studies, they experimented with booklets that would help inspire inexperienced groups by directing the program with particular exercises. Later, they turned to tapes that would guide the group process. Burzon and Solomon declared the intention of their early work to be the enhancement of the individual's social life and job advancement through better self-knowledge and interpersonal relations. Though they had some technical suggestions for improving technique, they were content that both professionally-led and self-directed groups witnessed a rise in positive self-concept, emotional revelation, and self-assertion. They believed that aggressive self-disclosure could only enhance relations. Burzon and Solomon revealed the new therapy's tendency to take mundane insights and elevate them to a kind of scientific practice, as they laid out the two dimensions of group behavior to be elicited, talking and listening. Their description of the steps on the way to greater awareness of the relationship between behavior and feelings revealed their assumptions about what kind of talk would benefit both interpersonal relations and the individual. They listed a set of goals along with the intermediate behavior necessary for the criterion, or ideal, behavior that had to occur if the goal was to be met. An excerpt from their description of the encounter group process illustrates this. Goal. To experience more fully in awareness one's own feelings. Intermediate behavior. Talking about the public aspects of self. Talking about private aspects of self. Talking about private aspects of self with description of feelings. Criterion behavior. Talking with direct expression of here and now feelings. It is clear that the more complete the disclosure of private feelings in the group setting, the more therapeutic Burzon and Solomon deemed the activity. They summarized the content of the encounter sessions, beginning with a consensual group ranking of a list of ten characteristics employers look for in a good employee. A tape playing in the room presented a number of exercises. For instance, the unfortunate circumstance had participants go around the room to discuss their feelings about their worst life experience. Self-appraisal had them discuss which of the ten traits of good employees they should work on the most. Feeling pooling had them write out anonymous notes about strong feelings harbored toward another member of the group, with the notes then read aloud and elaborated on by the group. Confrontation had members go around the room telling each person exactly what they felt about him or her. Clients revealed greater transparency, which meant the experiment was a success in the eyes of Burzon and Solomon. They reported that people became more open, sensitive to others, self-accepting, and self-motivating. Perhaps what was most noticeable about the activities in both the directed and the undirected encounter groups Betty Burzon was involved in was what seems to be their sheer uneventfulness. Transcripts from one of the interracial encounter groups based on Burzon's techniques present detailed conversation about how the participants felt initially. I don't exactly feel afraid, but I feel comfortable within the group. What they felt initially about one another while touching the others one at a time. Hank, you seem like a very warm individual. What they felt about sharing those feelings. There was a feeling within me related to how the people that I was talking to really felt. How they felt about an exercise in which the group stood in a circle around a person, held hands, and would not let the person break out of the circle. I didn't think about race at all. And how they felt at the end of the workshop. Why don't those of us here have lunch together? The lack of direction evident in encounter groups as they actually played themselves out pinpoints what is disturbing about the lens of the therapeutic sensibility more generally when used as a mode of understanding the social world. Despite all of the hyperbole and bluster about the potential of the encounter group to let loose the wrongfully corralled facets of our inner beings, what happens in practice seems notably uneventful. The encounter group was the epitome of the long-term shift from what the historian Rochelle Gerstein calls the reticent sensibility to the therapeutic one, with its premium on emotional transparency. The sociologist James L. Nolan Jr. has captured the nature of this sensibility well. It centers on the self and its impulses. It conceives of society as something the self must be liberated from. It celebrates release rather than self-denial. Its emotivist motif appeals to the emotions above other faculties, and it casts the self as victim and human behavior primarily in terms of psychic health or pathology. Even when presented as allied with a movement as committed to a moral vision of justice as the civil rights movement, this approach shows a clear tendency to cheapen and trivialize the depth and complexity of human emotion, as well as the content of social bonds. Richard Sennett has written that centering on the self in this fashion, besides degrading relations with those who are our intimates, erodes the very basis of our relations with those who are not. The measurement of all of social life in psychological terms rules out the vital impersonal standards of conduct and the social masks that allow us to differentiate our public from our private selves, the very distinction that makes it possible to live up to these standards. Here, intimacy is a field of vision and an expectation, he notes, that actually diminishes the quality of social relations by investing them with undue pressures and false expectations.
In so doing, the public world itself is denied legitimacy as a place and a forum for different kinds of pursuits and connections from those appropriate to the private sphere. People seek out or put pressure on each other to strip away the barriers of custom, manners, and gesture which stand in the way of frankness and mutual openness, and assume that the absence of such barriers will lead only to warm relations. The result is inevitable disappointment, which only worsens social isolation, the initial catalyst for emotional disclosure. The highly touted authenticity of behavior in actuality leaves individuals dry, since it fosters transitory emotional revelation, rather than the richer expression that takes place only when private boundaries have been maintained. In the absence of any real inner life, the emotional expressions to be shared become purely self-referential, a matter of technique and not content, and ultimately devoid of meaning.